Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful evening of readings from the Windfall Reading Series. My name is Wendy, and I work at the Public Library, Eugene Public Library, to be specific, and I'm really glad to welcome you to April's Windfall Series. Uh, we have two authors who will be introduced by Henry Alley, who is the Lane Literary Guild uh, Chair. So before he introduces our wonderful readers, I thought I would just say a couple quick things. First of all, a couple of thanks, of course, to the Lane Literary Guild, without which none of this could happen. And we're so grateful that they are um, working in conjunction with Eugene Public Library to uh, allow such wonderful readings every month. It's just a delight. So thank you to you. And thank you also to the friends of the Eugene Public Library. They make so many of our programs possible through book sales and events and through support. And we are eternally grateful to them as well. Um, if you have questions during this reading, at the end of the readings, we are going to have a question and answer time. So open up, ask anything you want about the process, about individual pieces that the, the authors read, um, anything like that. And you can do that a couple of different ways. Um, one way is you can write your questions right into the comment section below this screen in YouTube. Um, and if you're feeling a little shy and you don't want to do that, let me pop up my email here. You are more than welcome to email me as well. This is my work email and I will be monitoring it throughout the reading. And you can have an anonymous question if you're feeling shy. You can um, give me a pen name if you'd like, a pseudonym, anything like that. And I'm glad to read it for you. So please do feel free to ask questions. We love hearing them. Um, and let me get this off so you don't have to keep this staring at you. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Henry Alley from the Lane Literary Guild, and he will introduce our readers. Thank you much, Mindy. Well, uh, I'm delighted to be here tonight and representing the Lane Literary Guild in our Windfall series. Uh, the Lane Literary Guild has been active here in our Eugene area since 1984. And I was there when um, uh, Bill Sweet and uh, a number of other people were active. Uh, Ingrid Wendt, who actually thought of the Lane Literary Guild in the first place, were active in putting this together. And actually our first uh, distinct, uh, first reader was of Bill Stafford. Uh, so we have a we have a history and we're just delighted to continue it through these many, many years and seeing so many changes. In the early 1990s, we introduced the Windfall series whereby uh, each month uh, during a particular season, usually from September to June, two featured writers from our area would read um, uh, in tandem. And uh, we have been de delighted with the diversity that we have seen. And uh, tonight we have two wonderful poets, uh, Erica Goss and Karen McPherson reading tonight. And I am so happy to introduce them. Um, for one thing, I've known them for years. And uh, also both of them have been very, very active in promoting the literary world here in the Eugene area, and we are so grateful to them and to give them an opportunity to read their work when they have been so supportive of, of other uh, poets and writers. So uh, tonight, uh, reading first is Erica Goss. Now, Erica Goss served as Poet Laureate of Los Gatos, California from 2013 to 2016. And in 2019, she won the Zocalo Poetry Prize she is author of Night Court, winner of the 2016 Lyrebird Award, Wild Place, and Vibrant Words, Ideas and Inspirations for Poets. Recent work appears in Lake Effect, Atticus Review, Contrary, Convergent, Convergence, Spillway, Cider Press Review, Electica, The Tishman Review, Tinderbox, The Red Wheelbarrow, and Main Street Rag, among others. She is the founder of Girls Voices Matter, an ed arts education program for teen girls. Erica is the editor of Sticks and Stones, a monthly poetry newsletter. Please visit her at www.ericagoss.com. 
And um, I want to say of her work um, that she has such an interest, such interesting juxtapositions among other very, very vibrant uh, images that are in her work, as well as the, the, the music of it as poetry. In one of the poems called Answer the Phone, she has these lines. We want to show them the pictures we've taken since they left us, that cathedral in Central Europe. I'm sorry. We want to sh show them the pictures we've taken since they left us, that cathedral in Central Europe, the jellyfish at the California Aquarium. We forget what we needed to tell the dead as we rush too quickly from sleep. You know, and uh, this, that, that juxtaposition of the cathedral with the jellyfish uh, seems to me one of the hallmarks of her work and uh, part of the enjoyment of reading this collection uh, called Night Court. So I would very much like to introduce Erica Goss and her reading for tonight. Thank you, Hank. That was Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and yeah, I do love to juxtapose things. The, um, the cathedral and the jellyfish at the aquarium, I just happened to visit both of those in one summer and they came together in that poem. So I'm going to start with some newer work and then I'll work backwards into time and I'll read some poems from my collection, Night Court, um, which came out in 2017. So I'm going to start with a poem called Life in the Anthropocene. You opened your arms and said, as long as we're together, whatever tore between us, we'd stitch it up. I thought words were solutions. I thought problems existed to be solved. Repeated enough times, words lose energy. It's as if we're asleep at sea, blind to the beacon that sweeps the horizon. We ignore the glacier calving in the distance. Though every wave tries to warn us, and every gull's song throbs with the knowledge. Alrighty, and this one is kind of a weird dream poem guzzle. You know that version form with the repeated line at the end, or the repeated word? It's called The Iceman. My mother worried about me. She said I had strong bones, but I'd been sick lately. She, said me, she fed me broth made of bones, skimmed and strained, clear and warm. I think about dinosaurs, how their massive bones used to fascinate me, the leaching, carbonization, weaving stones in place of bones. Some days I longed for a genteel illness, something Victorian, leading to fragility, pitted bones, a migraine pallor. I admit it, I loved being sick, Love the feverish tremor in my bones, mother's face floating in and out of dreams. Her spine bent over me, a pillar of bones as I tried my best to breathe, my chest expanding, mind hollow as bird bones. I think of the 5,000-year-old ice man, frozen in the Alps in his skin-swaddled bones. The woman who found him shares my name, and maybe the aching in my bones that grows every year. Maybe you were both related to the Iceman, connected by blood and bone. Mother called me from a dream and I woke chilled to the bone that life is more than illness after all and health is precious. I build my structure, starting with bones. Alrighty, and this one, let's see, I wanna make sure I have the time right. Um, this is a little, prose poem piece that I wrote. Um, it comes from a memory from way, way back in my childhood about something that happened that could have turned out very differently. It's called, I was on my way to Arizona. My family didn't love me. I thought I was air they looked through, my mother tells me, and how at the age of 12, she packed her little knapsack and placed it by the door where her mother found it, at first bewildered, then angry. A memory pulls itself out of me. When I was 12, a man and woman came to our chaotic, lightly supervised home. Come to Arizona with us, they told me. 
I made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and put it in my lunchbox with the two pair of panties I thought I would need for the journey from California to Arizona. As I snapped the latch on my lunchbox, my young father, not yet 40, lowered his long body onto my bed, fixed me with his hazel eyes, and explained, not unkindly, that I wasn't going anywhere. My mother never knew how my ladybug panties ended up in my lunchbox. A year after my mother tried to run away, her mother went to the hospital and died. When my mother tells me this, I remember something else, that I was conceived in the attic of the house she'd tried to leave, and the fact of me, the mistake of me, allowed her to finally escape that house via a hasty wedding at age 22. Then I understood. I was on my way to Arizona because I was a kid hoping for an adventure, because I was beginning to develop my penchant for trusting strangers, for only looking one way when I crossed the street, because of the stubbornness that plagues me today, but not because my family didn't love me. Quite the opposite, I think. I love maps. I have maps all over my office. Um, and this poem is kind of about that. It's called Geography. We think a map owes us something. We blame it when we get lost. Even so, we keep looking at it as if somehow it will give in and show us the way. Find things in me, it says. Look closer. A map is never the wrong map. A map of lakes is also a map of clouds. There are star maps, faith maps, trail maps, life maps, love maps, mind maps. On urban maps, highways spread out from the center of town like cracks in glass. When I bring a map an inch from my face, cities double and then disappear. If a country has debts it cannot pay, you can tell by its shape on a map. On maps, weak countries surround strong ones like starving dogs. Maps watch you, talk to you, tell others where you are. They shine from your pockets like little suns. There is no loneliness like a map. Take me with you, it says. Don't leave me here alone. And here are a couple of Oregon poems. First one is called Donating Books to St. Vincent de Paul. I surrender them, loose in grocery sacks. When they shift, it sounds like whispering. I cannot seem to leave. I stand where tree after tree fell to the valley floor. A few miles from here, the paper factory pumps sulfur into morning dew. Rain has almost washed this parking lot away. A din of little drops dots my blue flannel shirt. Mouth tastes of cardamom. A raindrop hits me near the eye, but the sky stays neutral. When I start the car to leave, it sounds like a wad of paper bursting into flame. And this one is The State of Jefferson. Trucks shuffle in the slow lane. Mount Shasta is a crazy white cone. I drive as fast as I dare. Car, my shelter, my tiny house of spiders' nests and trash. Even in an imaginary land, you need to refuel. 8.5 gallons of unleaded and I-5's traditional cuisine. Crinkly bags of Chex Mix and sour worms at Manfredi's Food and Gas Depot in Dunsmuir. On the passenger seat, a thumb-sized jar of my father's ashes. I'd be lying if I said it didn't give me a weird little thrill to have him sat, sit where I sat as a child, those deeply dull hours in our Dodge Dart, him driving too fast and lecturing me about dog breeds and the French Revolution. Just after the sign that says college weed with arrows in front of each word pointing in opposite directions, I take the curve a little fast reach over, write the jar of my father's ashes, saying, sorry, did I scare you? We hurtle past the Oregon welcomed you sign with its eight black trees spotlighted in the evening dusk. I'm flying faster and faster down the mountain towards Ashland, but we're still in Jefferson, my father and I, land of the elegantly rusting Penelope the dragon, of signs proclaiming no monument and Bigfoot crossing, 
of few people and a few million cows. I chew the last of the sour worms. High fructose powder dusts my fingers. How you doing, Dad? He doesn't answer. Perhaps at last he's fallen asleep. And this one's called Leaving California, a thing I did about four years ago. We light the vanilla candle. San Jose is expensive and sad. It's turned cold again and the olive tree drops green and mauve leaves. My brother talks of loss and marriage as he walks through Central Park, his black eyes fresh and firm as young olives. Next year at this time, we'll look out the window at one perfect peak like a painting of Mount Fuji. Next year at this time, my brother will be a teacher in a city deep in dirty snow. Who will look at the olive tree with its bloom loaded boughs? Who knows? In the lull before the packing, we count the things to leave behind, the wasp traps of black and gold, the yearly crops of olives, and how the dogs next door cried with every siren that went by. This is called Object Lesson. When I saw a huge tattooed man cradle a carton of eggs like a newborn, open the soft cardboard lid and nudge each oval with one blunt finger. I thought of the morning news showing dozens and dozens of children crouched in cages like factory chickens, small hearts pounding. A child's heart weighs hardly anything, less than the carton the man closed and placed as carefully as glass in the basket of his shopping cart. On top of the plastic flap, warning that children should not stand up or be left unattended. After the migraine, this is another organ poem. Spread between trees, webs shimmer like the auras that float across my vision. Spiders exit outgrown skins, leave crisp exoskeletons all over the garden. Once I left a too small house in a too small town, stretched my limbs in the damp fresh air, the memory of pain still delicate, like the outer edge of a spider web fraying in the autumn wind. Too long I believed that anything at all, no matter how hopeless, could be put to right. Fine as silk, my illusions billowed around me. Now the branches are hung with the bodies of stunned flies, wrapped and waiting, and the road that brought me here splits into exits. Long after the pain subsides, stars appear when I close my eyes. Earth hum. My ears to the ground, I measure the night in terms of sound. My bones vibrate, oceans fill with noise, rumbles reach me through brains of whales. What music is this? Rhythmical, dense, composed by machines talking in wavelengths. Frequencies lower to darkness, connections cluster under my ear, aftermaths, murmured confessions, insurgent seeds, germs of impractical schemes, shudders of long dead delight. Here I lie in my floral nightshirt, earth humming all around, my ear to the ground. I measure the night in terms of sound. That poem was almost a villanelle, and this poem is a villanelle. It's called Portal. I once believed that shells contained the sound of the sea. I lived in a gabled house then, painted lake blue under a dense florid sky a thousand miles from shore. From shells, I learned the power of curved things, bells, bowls, my hands cupped against my two ears. I once believed that shells contained the sound of the sea. My body was an ear, bone and hair and nerve. I could turn any sound into salt wind waves 
and seagull cries under a dense florid sky a thousand miles from shore. Growing up meant losing beautiful things. How is it possible to lose an ocean? I once believed that shells contained the sound of the sea. Silence could not be trusted, its weight like layers of silt. I feared the silence of inland places, of walking alone under a dense florid sky a thousand miles from shore. I am not through with believing. I stroll on the beach today. The wind and the waves take me back to the time when I once believed that shells contained the sound of the sea under a dense florid sky a thousand miles from home, from shore, a thousand miles from shore. And uh, I'll close this section with a poem that is based on an actual incident. It's called The Pomegranate. I am struggling to finish this enormous fruit, which I bought on sale at the grocery store. When the clerk rang it up, the cash register stalled and refused to accept her repeated keystrokes, causing her to have a minor panic attack and apologize over and over for the delay and call the manager, who arrived just as the register unfroze and all of the keystrokes were suddenly processed and now had to be reversed, or I would have had to pay for 20 or so pomegranates, which caused the clerk to break out in a sweat. I kept telling her it's okay. And then I remembered that the apple in the Garden of Eden was probably a pomegranate. And so this fruit has been causing problems for a long time. All right, I'm gonna read um, some poems from Night Court. And I'm gonna start at the end um, with the poem that is called Love Poem with Broken Things. This poem is dedicated to my husband. I like to think of him as a small boy, disassembling the old phonograph his father gave him. When we moved in together, he filled our garage with red metal toolboxes, boxes with drawers inside of drawers, stuffed with wrenches of every conceivable size, drill bits, washers, screws, and nails. It seemed as if he knew our life ahead contained a lot of broken things, and he, for one, was prepared. Back then, his boxes of tools annoyed me, tripped me, forced me to park in the driveway. But now, when I think our life cannot accept another broken, hopeless thing, I know that somewhere in the garage, he has a tool that will mend it, tighten it, wire it, or stabilize it, and if he doesn't, we've learned to let it go with a shrug, like when he finally admitted he couldn't put the phonograph back together and solemnly handed the screwdriver back to his father. Early morning, San Bernardino, 1969. Even then I knew my father was waiting for a message and we were supposed to be witnesses. He could not stop his mind's wild associations, but the sky kept its silence, tar black and star smeared. My brother whimpered, pinned against the swing set while daddy pointed at the heavens, his, do you see it, do you see it? More and more frantic, but we didn't see it, wanted our beds, shrank from him as he trembled, holding his head with both hands and the unruly stars burned out in a desert morning. This poem is called I Am No Falconress and it takes its title from a poem by Robert Duncan, which has the line, my mother would be a falconress. He was born with long sharp nails and when I tried to trim them, blood welled up and the nurses pursed their lips. He hears the little bells when he turns his head. A young raptor, my boy, the intense eye, the slash from flesh to bone. It takes my breath away, his need for flight. My mind follows him into the blue sky where I am not allowed to go. I am no falconress, yet the hood and tether are there all the same and I feel the claws at my wrist. 
Blindsided. Amid the rap, hip hop, house, and electronica, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony has found its way to my son's iPod. When Beethoven wrote the pastoral, he knew he was going deaf, a fact I think about when my son pretends not to hear a word I say. During World War II, the first four notes of the Fifth Symphony ended Netherlands radio news bulletins. Beethoven's Bonn birthplace barely survived an Allied bomb. I think about that too when my son turns my own words against me, and I feel like a building where something significant once happened, and people still walk by, stop, nod, and take pictures. And a couple more. All right. This is called Afternoon in the Shape of a Pear. It's the result of rather unwisely volunteering to pick up a bunch of pears at a friend's orchard and ending up with a lot of them. 100 pounds on the kitchen counter, shoulder to shoulder like sweet lumpy trolls. I touch each one, feel hidden seeds moving and the hairy tickle of the blossom ends. Something so bland takes sharpness well. Blue cheese, the paring knife. Perishable flesh, glowing like pearl, leaves sugary grains under my fingernails. In its lopsided heart, a lute-shaped crater hides the worm who, though blind, knows the importance of being first. And I will end with the last poem in Night Court appropriately called Photographs of Elderly Poets. Um, here we go. Photographs of Elderly Poets. What strange old children, the beard-frosted men, the women in their windy hair, reprobate elders with parabolic ears and tunnel black mouths. Their skulls swell under stretched and spotted skin, Word eaters, collectors of small poisons, their days and their poems are numbered. They gaze past us, odd-eyed, alive in the floating world, even as death stands behind them, filling the empty spaces in the photographs with raw boned light. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erica, for what a wonderful journey and uh, the wonderful variety of your poetry. And uh, before we move on uh, to Karen, uh, I, I do want to uh, give a reminder that the River Road Reading Series will be holding a poetry presentation, poetry and prose presentation this Sunday, April 25th um, at from 4.30 to 6. And that will be um, via Zoom, and all you have to do is just go into Google and put in the River Road Reading Series, and that should take you to the, the proper connection uh, so that you can enjoy the series. Like this like this one, uh, there should be also a recording of that reading as well. Uh, we'll be having our own Sherry Wilburn, who's been so important to the Lane Literary Guild and forming, for example, um, the Lane Writers <coughs> uh, Network and um, Charles Castle, who's been very active in his reading of his poetry. And um, Sherry is also a poet. And then we have Mike Maggio, who is the author of 10 books. Um, so uh, again, I want to remind you to enjoy their reading, which is coming this Sunday. Also, uh, I want to put a reminder in that we have our own lean literary, and we have our own literary bookstore here in Eugene, Tsunami Books, um, and their number is on the screen now, and it is a uh, great that they uh, support us in so many ways. They've often been the residents of our critique groups for our uh, Lane Literary Guild, and they have also supported so many of us writers in various readings at, at their store. So I really encourage you to uh, 
support them. And I know that you can special order both Karen and uh, Erica's uh, poetry books from them. The other thing that I would like to remind you of is that we do have our own uh, Lane, Lane Writers uh, Network, um, and you can access it through this, this link. And in that, you will find not only the activities for the Lane Literary Guild, including Windfall, but you'll also find other literary activities in our, our general area. Um, uh, one feature of the Lane Writers uh, Network is that there is a author spotlight and presently Diane Dugas uh, work is uh, receiving a spotlight and she she read um, a couple of months ago and uh, you'll be able to enjoy her work again. So it's now time to move on uh, having given you those announcements. Uh, to Karen McPherson, um, who actually occupied the spot that I have now of being the windfall coordinator, and she served faithfully for two years uh, presenting uh, various writers throughout our area, and we're really grateful for her for all her work that she did. Um, also, she is a professor emerita of Francophone literature at the University of Oregon. She is the author of the poetry collection, Skeen of Light, Arley Press, uh, 2014, and um, the 2012 uh, chapbook, uh, Sketching Elise. Her work has appeared in literary journals, including the Beloit Poetry Journal, the Cincinnati Review, Comstack Review, Chicago Quarterly Review, and the Potomac Review. Between 2013 in 2017, she worked as an editor in the Arley Press Co Poetry Collective. She was coordinator of the Lane Literary Guild Windfall series from 2016 to 2018. As I said, since her retirement, Karen has been writing poems and translating the work of several uh, contemporary Quebec women writers. She has recently completed a translation into English of a volume of poetry by uh, Louise Dupree. Her current writing projects include a chat of punctuation poems and full-length poetry manuscript called Trebles Blooms. Um, I, I stand corrected by myself. Uh, it's gain of light. <laughs> and uh, I, I just want to say that her poetry, uh, like Eric's, is, is stunning in its own way. You, you open it up and you get lines like this. This is from the poem Beneath. Beneath the morning's silent listening and evening's bells are ringing hands. Under this ancient lake bed marshes sing sad arpe arpe arpeggios. So, you know, we have this really interesting, again, juxtaposition. And we're actually asked to think of the morning with uh, having a silent listening capacities. And we're asked to look at the evening bells as ringing hands which is a nice connection as well. Um, we also have this nice phrase, um, something contraband we do not hear, asked to hear contraband. So we have those lines like that throughout her work. And without further ado, I would like to introduce um, Karen McPherson. Thank you so much, Hank, um, for that introduction. And thank you for keeping Windfall going so brilliantly, you and the Lane Literary Guild and the Eugene Public Library. And thank you, Wendy, for what, managing the um, complications of getting this all going. I really appreciate it. Erica, that was stunning reading, and I'm thrilled to be sharing this reading with you. Um, this has been quite a past year or two. And I think like a lot of people, I've been profoundly shaken and um, found myself really looking at things anew and deeply questioning. And I think the events of the past year um, and the challenges have magnified for me and put into a different perspective some of the things that have been ongoing obsessions and interests and concerns for me, um, things having to do with loss and memory and um, aging and human perception and consciousness. Um, so I thought I'd sort of set the stage for this reading by 
reading a couple of poems that for me um, are about these obsessions and concerns, but refracted through my um, other obsession, which is my relationship to language. So this one is called Aphasia, and this um, is, is a somewhat older poem, but remains um, very immediate for me. Aphasia. Ghosts of syllables sluice in. I'm grasping for purchase, one word at a time. Listening fingers slipping, slipping on a rounded edge. I'm aching for the clarity of birdsong, trebles, blooms. Even just to let it all drain out, be left blessedly untroubled by seepages. But I'm struggling to come to terms with dissolving accretions, willing to abandon morsels, deft, incisive, the well-punctuated phrase too painfully labored over. Why still so enamored of the line break? What is so precious about a proper name? More to the point, what century is this? Heavy furniture exhales the vapors of conversations I can't quite hear, echoes of families I once lived on the outskirts of. In that childhood, a grandmother knew how to coddle eggs. Wit was universally admired. Books were mappable places, vast territories visited and claimed and named and owned. Now in this century, the table is set for a meal I haven't planned. Floral centerpiece, napkins intricately folded into birds, but the knives are all dull and I can't remember which side the fork goes on. And this one is much more recent and it, um, I, this past sort of late in the summer started writing um, a series of poems inspired by the glows form that uh, Marilyn Hacker uses so brilliantly in her book Names. And the idea of the glows is you take an epigraph it's uh, four lines, of, usually from the end of a poem by another poet, and you use each of those lines as the last line of one of the four stanzas that you write. So I started writing these glows poems, and this one um, started out as a formal glows and then slipped its mooring. So it's no longer really um, meeting the form strictly, but it's, that's its starting point. It's called A Loss for Words. And the epigraph from Marilyn Hacker, Again, the river. Sentence fragments float on a wave of syntax. Images imprinted in contemplation. Indistinct impressions of conversations which marked some turning. At a loss for words, you listen first for letters to declare themselves. I am J, I am L. Invite them to sit with you a spell. When they flutter in, first words for birds, J lark, and then for all those longitudes and latitudes that mark their territories, you notice how the accidentals hover and alight. You move from lexicon to library. All the books are out of date, out of print, out of circulation. Typed and yellowed cards on their spindles crowd the wooden drawers. Dust jackets jacketed in dust keep telling the same old story. The rooms are hushed and heavy with the seriousness of scholars, and you can scarcely breathe under the weight of metaphor and illusion. You're tempted to start making things up. You want to shout out the ugliest names for birds, Dick Sissel, Dunlin, Auk, or the prettiest names for ugly things, Rubella, Sunstroke, Amanita. But it's time to listen harder for something else the letters might be saying. You leave the bird book and binoculars on the porch. You don't renew your library card. You crayon out your scribbled alphabet. Finding the river once again, you slip into its chattering, drape yourself in its flirty shimmer. And um, also sort of setting the stage, I thought I would read two um, basically pandemic more, that more directly address this pandemic year. Um, and this first one is also a glows form um, based on a poem by Jen Kenyon called August Rain After Haying. And this one is still more closely moored to its form than the previous one. The epigraph from Kenyon goes, the grass resolves to grow again, receiving the rain to that end, but my disordered soul thirsts after something it cannot name in the biting. 
I'm biding time, hoping to leave room for whatever future might at some future time decide to grace us with its presence. Knowing full well that it may not, that this may be that tipping point, so I greet each day in a holding pattern, biding time until the masks come off, until the grass resolves to grow again. I examine the leaf, its shiny, almost waxy surface, how light shines through the green to silhouette its needle veins, red-tinged lattice, how it folds slightly to cup the light that pools. I trace its curve from tip to stem, green cells drawing life down twigs and branches to the root, roots shooting life back up to leaf, receiving rain to that end. Each month has its litanies. March was tallies of the dead and dying. April, days in quarantine. May is reprise, planet as body, more dead, more dying, more days in quarantine, planet as omen. May is reprisals, planet as bodies resigned to the common ground. May is drowning, but my disordered soul still thirsts. I'm wondering what it means to be a stone, reaching after something it cannot name. In my hand, it is the size of a small bird, but far heavier. Smooth on one side, rough like weathered siding on the other. Splinters of silver glint against dull grays and browns. I'm in the biding here, holding each hour, each day, the leaf, the stone. And the other um, recent little pandemic somewhat more lighthearted, if you can call it that, pandemic plaint um, goes like this. I'm letting myself go. I'm so tired of self-improvement. I'm envying the poets. It was a hard year. I wish I could offer songs and sustenance, but instead I'm letting myself go. I'm eating lots of butter. Butter on everything, toast and radishes. I'm gorging on butter and cheese and bad TV. I'm not watching what I eat. I'm not counting on anything. I'm not staving off the stroke. I'm making lists, grocery, and to do. I'm so tired of myself, so tired of myself pitying. I'd give anything to be someone else right now. I'd love to be a bird focused only on her nest and eggs, brooding on the weather. I'm terribly envious of the poets. I'm so tired of being envious, I wish I were a bird. Um, and as Hank mentioned, I am working on a little chapbook of punctuation poems. I find myself totally fascinated, fascinated by punctuation. And also um, by the, the actual working title of this book is punctum, and I'm fascinated by this word. If you want to look at a really neat word, look it up. It's got all kinds of signifiers in art and photography, but also in um, anatomy. It's like a word that you use for a tear duct. This, is, this poem is called Punctuations. I'm climbing the stairs, naming banister and baluster, landing on the landing, railing at risers, each step another word. A single thread dangling from the hem of a skirt, flash of silver, sting, speck, snag, the painting dissolves before my eyes. The wind is underlining each and every tree, stressing its treeness, every raindrop trembling on every leaf, a punctum. I've swallowed a time bomb, it's ticking beneath my ribs. I can't hear it, but I feel it. I'm breathing in my brain. If you sliced into my arm, you could count the rings in ever-narrowing circles, decades, days, minutes, seconds. Something pulls at the strings, and the whole orchestra wakes up, tucked into its tiny pouch in the corner, sadness spilling out. And I'll just read two more from the punctum um, collection. This one's called Ampersand. And, 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 flood the sea bowl, churn of milk foam, egg broth, wind whip, tattering, liquid slide to suck, to pool, draw back, to crack, to whirl, to shear, to even tide, to surfaces gloved in whitest cream, to glisten. But, but, but no listen to the damper sand, the jongleur's clever hand, his amber band, his singing monochrome, those trailing strands of foam, of track, of seawood, 
syntax and 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 it's back and foreground middle ground all back and foreground middle ground all 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 a glorious erasure until agitated sanderlings until then sudden birches And the last one from this section is called Ode to the Page. Have I told you just how much I love our love affair with punctuation? How my open quote keeps reaching to embrace your point virgule? That I find it sexy when we dress things up, affix a hook and eye to every turn of phrase, stitch tiny ivory buttons to each conjugated verb. Your gifts to me are an embarrassment of riches a looping blanket stitch of question marks, a glittering circumflex, a jaunty row of dashes at the edge of every broken line, an asterisk, an ampersand. I want you to keep speaking to me in that sultry accent of yours. Wrap me in ellipses, decorate, delineate, pretend we can stay forever entangled in these undertones. And then, of course, I've been... Um, revising what I was going to read right up to the last minute because I loved Erica's reading and especially the fact that she loves maps and geography and I hadn't been planning on reading anything from Skein of Light but I'm reading this one for Erica. It's called A Map of Maps. It's for my grandfather who was a geographer. Childhood was a mischief of maps, coded imaginings on every wall, quilts of the prairie states, Wabash, Calabash, scrawl of river lace, Sault Ste. Marie to the Missouri confluence, periscopic contourings of range and ridge and rim, graded blues to the ocean's deepest troughs, cross-hatched elevations of tectonic plates and slides. The Mississippi Delta spilled into my bathtub, Climbing the stairs, a history of the West, 1830 to 1910, above the guest room dresser, Antarctica, misshapen dinner plate in alabaster, tiny black names etched, etched around its chipped and fluted edge. Being anywhere meant standing on a map. Eyes were compasses, arms protractors, spine and shoulders, straight edge, theodolite, in a back pocket, always a notebook for the legends and the scale. A child could get lost as long as she had a map to draw the tracings of that errancy. Men made them, but a girl could set out deep south, far east, true north. Um, just a couple of poems now from Treble's Blooms. Um, they, everything seems to be about the tensions between holding on and letting go. And that's true of this poem as well, but this is also one that um, shows that I'm not only obsessed with punctuation, but also with grammar. This is called Imagining Herself Contiguous. She has been, will be, will have been, pondering the pleasures of hindsight, foreshadow. No time like the present perfect, though it's not, and she's chosen, or will have, a nearly perfect future, a slight of grammar. Back in time, who could have anticipated how much past every future would have dangling from its cuffs. She could imagine herself perfectly dead, nowhere else to go, Roger thrilling her with dead to spent to final on to perfect and then back again. Now she can't help rhyming sparse with parse, counting and hoarding the syllables she'll have left or left behind when all is or has been said and done. Um, this one's called Plenty of Infinity. Often it's this vortex into which the words are slipping. Panic hum circling the drain. Mind opens wide its metal jaws, snapping, snapping on nothing, hollow gong. And then how drawn into that pause, I have to wait, though there's no waiting there, until the honeysuckle lifted suddenly on the slightest breeze, can finally reclaim its name. Usually the incessant chatter of my mind's breath keeps the clocks ticking, counters counting, recounting, 
though sometimes time pleats those moments and I drift into the intervening spaces, music winding its silken ribbon through the ear and down the ivory pillar of the spine. I am suddenly remembering not the story that the photo's telling me, but the flesh of it, biting into an apple, sitting on the wooden steps between my mother and my daughter, my own 24-year-old incarnation, easy in the very middle of her life. There's a moment when the missing thing is found, a single silver earring in a fold of tissue in the corner of a suitcase. And that other, when the missing becomes the thing, mother gone, truly gone, never gone. And those animal days we can never get back, what our blue, blue eyes were seeing. been doing a lot of translating. Um, translation really pulled things together for me. It sort of made me understand how everything was translating and translating was everything. I can tell you more about that if you want to know. This is called Translating the Poem. Her form was familiar, smooth yet raspy, strangely but harmoniously shaped, dark as a nut wood, sunbeam bright. Tapping her against the counter, I heard a ringing. On the very tip of my tongue, she was something between Anise and Bergamo. I knew her large enough to take me six long miles into the village, small enough to balance on the little shelf of my ear. In my right palm, she was a small egg. In my left palm, a waterfall. One night, I pressed her like a bindi into my lover's brow. Ouch, said my lover, that hurts. I heard an echo in a foreign tongue. Ouch, that hurts. Sometimes I left her warming on the windowsill. Sometimes I tucked her into a drawer. On days when the sulfur burned my eyes, I pricked at all her indentured surfaces over and over with a nib of my pen. The clothes I dressed her up in were all wrong. I sang her lullabies, but she was already asleep. What would I give to keep her? What would she not give to get away? Um, the, I'm going to end with depending on time, yeah, two or three, um, that I think um, it's ending on a cautionary, but perhaps also somewhat hopeful note. Um, this, again, is one of the Glow's poems. Um, the epigraph is from Ada Limon, a poem called Late Summer After a Panic Attack, and the poem is called It's Winter Still. <clears throat> It's winter, though you wouldn't know. Oh, I'll read the Ada Limon first, I'm sorry. Lady Limon epigraph. Unanswered messages like ghosts in the throat, a siren whining high toward town, repeating that the emergency is not here, repeating that this loud silence is only where you live. It's winter, though you wouldn't know it. Jaunty sun, green spikelets in the flower beds. A man in shorts and sandals runs his dogs. I'm trying to forget this day like every day will narrow at the end flinging us back to January, our calls for company tapped out, unanswered messages, ghosts in the throat. It bears repeating this was not a normal year, dangerous to touch, difficult to breathe. Each morning woke me to a high alert, gorging at the news feed, buttoning, unbuttoning my panic. I kept no calendars, days were all the same. I kept too many vigils the sirens whining high toward town, repeating. With the fires, we learned emergency, how flames could dance, leap highways, rivers in mere seconds, how clouds of ash could travel 100 miles before settling on our flower beds, how neighborhoods could disappear, how ill-prepared we were, still thinking the emergency is not here, the emergency is not here. This is why it's winter still the shame of standing by and letting pass, the virulence, the virus we always knew was here but kept ignoring, our counterfeit histories, bones and skulls cemented into the bedrock of our safe houses. In many ways, this was a normal year. This loud silence is where we live. This is called Memory of Music, and there's an epigraph from Oliver Sacks. Music imprints itself on the brain deeper than any other human experience. 
When thoughts and memories slip their moorings, sliding into the what's-it drawer of my aging brain, when I find myself picking up and putting down tools whose uses I've forgotten, when my synapses stubbornly fail to fire and my frantic scrambling sends all the catalog cards spilling across the library floor, may some dimly remembered childhood song hold. As in Japan, the broken bowl is fitted back together along its jagged crack with a seam of gold, slender brilliance of brokenness. And I will close with a poem called Make Me, Gar Make Me Garden. <clears throat> An article in this week's Register Guard talks about composting humans. Body first cradled in wood chips, alfalfa, straw, bark and stem strewn, root twined, fed on oxygen, given a daily turning, turning into soil. This appeals. Having rejected formaldehyde the lead-lined coffin, I'd already made uneasy peace with the cadaver lab, the neatly labeled box of ash, dust to dust, sensible, frugal. But now I'm rethinking that noxious smoke and cinder, those heavy metals, that mercury from years of clumsy dentistry, the clouds of toxins floating free. No, make me dirt and leaves. Make me humus, make me moss and lichen, make me garden, make me forest floor. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for reading, Karen. It was a wonderful journey again with uh, wonderful, beautifully lit images, as is true with Erica as well. So we are now uh, open to questions uh, from our audience uh, if any are coming forward and if if not immediately i have some myself so wendy have any come in yet well, none in my email i've been watching carefully but there's still time so okay so to our viewers out there please uh, if you have any questions for either of our poets um, please prepare to um, ask them uh, I think I'll first ask Erica a little bit about the title of your collection, Night Court. Um, the, the way I, I responded to that title and also to the title poem was that it's um, about kind of an inner colloquy that, that one has um, with oneself. Um, I'm not asking you if that's the right interpretation because I know poets don't like that kind of question, but I, is there anything that you'd like to respond to as far as uh, what what a night court might mean? Um, no, that's actually a pretty good interpretation, Hank. Um, I wrote that poem after a period of extended insomnia, and I was having I was having trouble sleeping um, for like years and years. It was really kind of terrible. Um, but I got some poetry out of it. So it wasn't that bad, right? At least I had some material to write about. Um, and it was like, yes, it, I always felt like, um, first of all, you remember that TV show, Night Court? You remember that with, um, oh, who played? Harry Anderson play, played the judge. And I just, I love that show. I used to watch it all the time. So in my my years of insomnia, I would lie awake at night and I would imagine, you know, like what's it like to be in court at 1 a.m. because they would actually have people that late at night coming to pay traffic tickets or whatever they did, you know, minor offenses that they needed to go to court for. And so I would lie there thinking, well, you know, okay, I'll go over my minor offenses for the day, you know, maybe drank too much coffee or maybe I didn't drive as safely as I should or I was late to a meeting and so that whole idea of the night court sort of evolved through those experiences and sort of trying to keep my mind from going to the bad places you go to when you should be sleeping. Um, and I realized that, that that was really a process and that's where the poem came from. It ended up being the title of the whole book because yeah. many of the poems were written during that period and kind of mm -hmm. came out of that need to uh, occupy um, a mind that was too active and too anxious to mm -hmm. allow me to sleep. So mm -hmm. that's where that yeah, came from. I think that thread of inner colloquy does go through the poems. That's yeah. Really that's, that's wonderful. Um, um, we have a question from Amanda Powell, who's been one of our readers in the Windfall series. Um, 
she says here wow two beautiful readings Karen and then she says Karen the poem about translating the poem is the best statement about translation ever what poem were you translating <laughs> I was translating whatever poem I'm translating at the moment I don't know that there's a particular one that led to that but the experience of translating poetry certainly brings me to that place. Um, I've been doing a lot of translation of poetry, which is an absolutely impossible thing to do. I do from the French to the English, and I'm actually translating a Quebec poet who um, is also translating me from English to French. So part of what it's all about is that accompaniment in the um, sort of immersion, loving immersion in the, in the languages um, with the other, and um, that resistance um, is always there, and it does feel like it's all about relationships. So it really feels as though that was a way to talk about my relationship to the poem, but it obviously um, goes beyond that to be my relationship to language, to both languages, and then to the um, the poem coming from the other side to me as well is what I'm bringing to it. So um, no, I don't think I can't remember at exactly what I was working on point where I wrote that poem, but every time I sit down to begin translating that poem comes to, you know, what I said in translating the poem, that's the experience of it. So thanks for asking, Amanda. I was going to ask also, are there particular French poets, of course, which you have, which you read in the original, uh, that have had an influence on your, on your poetry? Well, you know, I taught French literature for years and, you know, had sort of deep um, love for, you know, the 19th century poets and uh, Mallarmé, Baudelaire, and into the 20th century and starting to read um, more contemporary uh, poetry. Um, I, in the sort of the last part of my um, teaching career, I really focused on Quebec. And so I'm most familiar with contemporary Quebec poets who are, you know, most of them still living, not all of them, that um, I've kind of immersed myself in. And it's interesting because it's a very, for me, it's a very different kind of poetry from the poetry that I write or even the poetry that I tend to read and appreciate in English. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of the appeal, I think, to me in working in translation. Great. For uh, Erica, we have a question from uh, from Al Rimple. Um, Erica, do video poems sometimes form <coughs> writing? That is, do you write with a camera lens in front of your view? Um, hi, Al. Great question. Al and I have worked together on video poems in the past. Actually, the last year we worked on two together, which were very successful. When they were screened all over the world, and um, it was a really fun experience. Um, I really never know what poem is going to become, is going to trigger that visual, you know, that urge, like, I'm like, oh my God, this has to be a video. I almost never know until it's done. Um, and I'm, I'm outside with my camera, like taking pictures of bugs or whatever you do when you've pandemic, right? And then I'll think, oh my God, this reminds me of that line I wrote. So it's a very, it's a, a process of really free association. Now, having said that, I have the other experience sometimes when I'm looking at images or videos that I've shot, I think, aha, I'm starting to hear the poem in my head that goes with these things. So I would say that the visu the visuals, the images are often more generative to me of writing. It's like I, knew, I know the poem now that goes with this series of images more than the other way around. So there's my answer. Great. Um, I have a question that I wanna ask uh of each of you, uh, the the wonderful prose writer David Bradley uh, read for us in, in February, and one of the wonderful things about that was is that I had known David for a number of years when he had taught at the University of, of Oregon, and then I was able to re reconnect with him. And both of us, both of us felt that in the midst of COVID. Uh, at least in the midst of COVID, that we could just not, could not write the way we had written prior to COVID. And um, and I just wondered for each of you, and I'll start with Karen, um, did you find that to be true? Uh, or uh, And if not, did, did there were certain significant things that impacted on you about the COVID uh, 
pandemic experience that altered your writing or may introduce new subjects to you? So I, I guess I'll start with you, Karen, on that. Definitely um, had a profound effect on me. COVID, the lead up to the election, the whole year leading up to the election and the election and what came after, um, the uh, Floyd murder, the Breonna Taylor, um, the wildfires in Oregon. I mean, it seemed as though every morning there would be something new that was so um, sort of deeply either horrifying or requiring a kind of attention and response that at the beginning, I think I felt the need to listen a lot, <laughs> um, to listen and pay attention and um, writing poetry at first sounded to me like it felt very much like it would be turning away or self-indulgent or irrelevant. Um, and it took me a while to realize that I needed to be writing in order to be engaged <laughs> with what was happening. Um, and that by writing, I was actually learning about ways in which it was changing the way I looked at the world. I think, you know, I do feel that this past year had a kind of a profound effect on sort of deeply questioning a lot of things and that that is making its way into my writing and part of it, the way it's making its way into my writing is struggling with the fact of you know, being who I am in my privilege and my little world here where I'm sitting here in this house, pretty much isolated, um, realizing what's happening on the planet and you know, politically, socially, ecologically. Um, it's been, yeah, it's really been pretty profound. So still making my way back into the writing. Yeah, thank you. How about you, Erica? Um, I definitely experienced a lot of what uh, Karen just put so so beautifully. Like, is it does it even matter? If I write now. Is anyone paying attention? Am I paying attention? Um, I felt the isolation really strong. I felt the lack of a community of people to to bounce ideas off of and to just see when I was out walking or driving around. I didn't even know how important it was to just see somebody at the grocery store, you know, just to say hi to the clerk. Those things matter. Those are social contacts, right? A uh, contact. Um, but oddly, I wrote more last year than I had before. Um, and I think it sort of became my go-to thing to do, like when I was just so, so emotionally just distressed about everything that was happening. Um, I found a lot of solace in writing and, and reading, and I did read a lot more poetry um, uh, than I had the, the year before. And I found some incredible stuff there, really inspiring things. And I didn't particularly read about pandemics or the flu or, you know, the Spanish flu or any, I did actually read a novel about the Spanish flu and I was like, eh, too depressing. So um, I tried, you know, I just, I did do a lot of writing, I did. Um, but I think I was also allowing myself to write whatever I felt like, and I was trying not to be judgmental about what came out. So a lot of it is extremely private and probably for no one's eyes but mine. But I felt like um, it wasn't so much therapy as um, a way to move through what was happening. Like we just had to keep moving through it. And I felt like, like Karen said, so much was hitting us all at once the the police brutality, the election, the never ending assault of the election coverage, then the fires, which we were all breathing, right? We were breathing all those houses that were burning on the Mackenzie every single day. I could barely function during the, with all that smoke. Um, I found that writing was really the thing that I could do. I couldn't go outside, couldn't do a lot of activities that I normally would do. So that was it. Yeah, I, I felt like, it, well, at least one word's following the other, you know? <laughs> yeah. Because I felt so backwards um, and so stymied. And I, and also just the idea, I, I took a workshop with Jane Smiley and she said, whatever you do when you write, don't judge it. 
-hmm. you know just keep writing every day just be see yourself as a sculptor slapping down clay on <laughs> and and then that's what i felt like is that there was a, some sense of progress in some form or other that's great wendy did we have any other questions come in no one uh took me up on my offer today so <laughs> okay all right i'm gonna ha i'm gonna have one final question for each um then and uh then we can uh, move on from there but uh i was just wondering uh, uh karen did did you in your, your really evocative poem can canning words <laughs> the idea of canning words is a really interesting idea to me um i sense something of uh both the liberation of words and the oppression of words and i wondered if you had anything to say about that subject particularly it surrounds that poem but, oh. but in, in general <laughs> That poem is a million years old. I'm thinking back. It actually was inspired. I was at the Vermont Studio Center and there was a visual artist there whose project was canning words and she was putting them on little scripts of paper and putting them into canning jars with dyes and things like that. So, I mean, it was a very concrete um, inspiration for it and it had me thinking about our relationships with words. And um, yeah, I mean, when I think about um, where my writing comes from it frequently comes it starts with just little snippets of language you know when i'm sitting down and i'm saying okay i'm sitting here with my pen and my paper and maybe i'll write something it's it's the you know it's the words that come first and i you know sort of um but then okay you know it's a little bit like trans it, what i wrote about in translating the poem i could write about you know me and chasing the words somehow there's a sense of um it's absolutely where my passion and attraction is and there's at the same time this sense of you know trying to grasp something and always missing it and then obviously with i mean i've been mar marveling recently about the fact that we learn to we learn to speak <laughs> which is kind of amazing and we have language and we learn to speak and then we live our lives and these words come to us without us even having to look for them i mean you, you just talk and whatever you have in your brain just comes out your mouth as you need it and you you know you say things and you don't have to stop and go looking for them and then as you get older sometimes they don't come quite as quickly and you have to go looking for them you know it's like they're there somewhere and i i just think it's all kind of incredible and um that's becomes the kind of an a uh, uneasy obsession for me very good great and erica in, in that wonderful poem you read about um bones uh, i believe it's not in night court right it's in New York, New York. no it's not night court New York. but um uh, about the dinosaur bones and the frozen man and so forth um i, I was wondering is am I, the kind of a comfort that one gets from this, the relics of things um, that, okay, there's death, but then there's kind of an etern eternality that's indicated by what's left behind. I'm also thinking of the poem about uh, the, the woman, the young woman, I presume it's, it's the speaker of the poem and the, the father on the car seat. Uh, is there something about relics that that contains a kind of comfort or anything you have to say about that, but it just seemed to me to be kind of a, a common thread in some ways. Um, that's interesting because I never actually made that connection before, Hank, that's really perceptive. But yes, bones show up a lot and um, a little uh, jar of my father's ashes is sitting right over there, I still have it. I talk to him all the time, that's a little weird, I know. Um, but, um, the, the dinosaur, the, um, the ice man, I was so fascinated by the story, right? They found this frozen Swiss guy that it, he just wandered into this cave and then he never came out. Like, I wondered, did his family wonder what had happened to him? Did they think, how come dad never came home? You know, because he had pouches of stuff that he'd been collecting. I think he had, I don't know, some rabbits he'd caught and some things that he'd been gathering to bring back. Um, and of course, you know, we all know that we're related, all of us are related to each other. So we're probably 
my family's from Central Europe, so we're probably connected to that ice man, I thought, as I was sort of free associating with the poem in my head. But then there's also the part about how I love the attention of being sick. You know, when you're a little kid and your mom fusses over you and, you know, that poem also, that's where the poem starts. And then I kind of go into what else does it mean about your bones? Like what's in your bones? What does, the Iceman left his bones including a lot of the rest of him. And now we know a lot about not just him, but about us. So I guess what, I guess my feeling about the bones is that they are the living and dead relic of life on earth, right? Our teeth and our bones last much longer than the rest of us. Mm-hmm. And they're scary when you're a child, you know, to see a skeleton or a skull without the stuff that doesn't make it scary, you know, your, your skin, your flesh, your face, but that's what keeps us standing up. And um, there's definitely, I mean, I guess the bones in that, but particularly that poem are the structure. It's the structure of the poem as well as the structure of the Iceman. So the bones are what hold the poem together because it's a guzzle and it has bone at the end of the second line in every stanza. So that holds it up, that's its structure. Mm-hmm. It's also about the structure of, of the bones inside all of us. So I guess in the, in the poem, I was sort of imagining what if I was always sick and my mom would always take care of me and then hover over me and I would be the favorite child because I would have this illness that would like make me have fragile bones and then I go to the dinosaur bones, and then I go to the Iceman. So, yeah, it's a it's a kind of a trip around the world via our human bones. Is is that poem available in print, or is it? Uh... It is not. It has not been published yet. So okay. I I'll will look, let you know. I'll look forward to seeing it for sure. Um, as I'll look forward to seeing some of your new poems, Karen, in print as well. Mm-hmm. I have a few final comments, um, but I want to turn to to Wendy to see if you had something you wanted to add. Um, I just wanted to, of course, thank Erica and Karen for your readings, moving and um, just fantastic. And thank you for uh, joining the Windfall series. And I think we have one more uh, reading next month and then we take a little break. Isn't that correct? That's correct. I uh, my, my, my final comments are to, well, first of all, yes, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful, beautiful uh, evening of poetry. I, I actually, you know, I'm a prose writer, but I have the opportunity through my connection with the Lane Literary Guild to just feel and see and, and experience the rich poetic talent that's that's in our, our immediate community. It's, it's just quite striking. Um, and this certainly tonight was an example. Uh, next next month, which would be on May 18th. The, again, we're on the third Tuesday of the month at 6 p.m. We'll have uh, two wonderful poets again, uh, Judith Montgomery, and um, uh, who uh, has read in the River Road reading series, of which uh, Erica is uh, one of the directors. And also we will have um, uh, Susan Leslie Moore, who uh, originally was going to read a few months ago, but couldn't because of the ice storm in Portland, and she will she'll be reading as well. So that's that'll be a wonderful combination. So um, thank you, Wendy, and thank you so much for the library's un, undying commitment to uh, literature in in our on our area here. And so, and I want to thank all our viewers for listening in and for all your supportive comments. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.